I want to talk about one specific time, and I want to ask you, have you ever robbed a guy for a burrito? <laughs> no, no, I have never robbed a guy for a burrito. Um, I did hold a guy up at knife point in Coeur d'Alene who dropped a burrito, but no, I never robbed a guy for a burrito. I was, Is that I was a Dave talking... Hutch? That's a Dave Hutch question. All right, no, I see no it was actually Sean. It was actually Sean, but Oh no, here's here's the story. Let me let me put this in context. So Good job. Yeah. You're pressing your vibe. Yo, what up, guys? It's Gary Vee, and it's time for the Daily Bread. Give us our daily bread. I want the whole basket, because I'm a hustle till I get it or I'm in a casket. Passionate for providing value in every way. Not cashing in for providing value every day. Paying it forward, right thing, I'll do it till I'm dead. I hope you're hungry, because it's time for the daily bread. What is up, everybody? This is Tyler Harris, your host, and this is the Breadwinner Podcast. I am uh, excited today to have a special guest, and that is Mr. Colby K. And I'm going to give a quick intro for him, but he will do a way better job at introducing himself. But man, the only thing I can say is Colby K is Colby K. And that's probably the best way you could uh, introduce anyone is by that. And he is a uniquely innovative executive, entrepreneur, influencer, film producer, speaker. And that's just to name a few roles. Uh, But man, Colby focuses on living with purpose and with the intention of leaving a legacy. He also runs one of the most impactful live events that exists called the Meltdown in the Desert that I'm sure he'll talk about. And I cannot wait to be at uh, in June. I will definitely be there. But at the end of the day, like I said, Colby K is Colby K. And that's it, man. So what's up? Thank you for being on the podcast, Colby. What's up, Tyler? Good to see you, man. You too, man. I feel like, dude, I I feel like... uh... I just have to have one name. Like, can I just go Colby, like Prince Dude, from Madonna? You got to. You got to. Just KK. <laughs> what about KK, maybe? <laughs> just Colby. What's up, man? My, my, my two-year-old son has never called me by my name. Or he never calls me dad. He calls me by my name because that's what he hears people calling me. That's so he's called me Colby, and I let him get away with it. His new thing now is Colbs. He says, Colbs. <laughs> Come here, Colbs. That's so my two-year-old awesome. has a nickname for me, a nickname of the nickname, which is hilarious that to me. That is awesome. So tell so dude, everybody, man, your, like, who, who you know, are you? I look at your list of people. You got Dom. You got my man Dom. Yeah. Andy Frisella. Yeah. My boy Sean Whaley. You got yeah. Reezy Resells on. You dude. got my homies on your show, dude. I, I know. Like, it. I feel like, I mean, all these circles, you realize, like, how small they really are. And I feel like all your people, like, they're my people. And it's just it's so funny, man. And so he, I think we had reached out a couple of times, but then you reached out to me like, dude, like, why have we not talked yet? <laughs> and I was like, That's I have right. no idea. That's I've been right. watching your stuff. And, man, I love it. So uh, let me answer the question. So, yes. you know, to, to put it in a in, in a very compact thirty thousand foot answer, and then we could dive into some of the stuff. And yep. you know, knowing your audience that that's out there, they're business owners, they're entrepreneurs, they're in the marketing space, they have a day job, maybe they are the full day job. Is there's a lot of stories, man. And when I tell you what I've done and where I've come from, really, it's it's been the art of the pivot. You see, I grew up uh, at a high level. I'm a, a film producer. I run a film production studio here in Phoenix, Arizona, and um, I'm an author. I am a public speaker. I'm kind of a, you know, I'm a father and I'm a husband. That's what I do. And in this, you know, I was born and raised in Salt Lake City. I have uh, two, you know, hardworking parents. My mother was a was an entrepreneur. My dad, you know, dug a shovel, worked for the water company, and was just uh, interested in getting, you know, kind of doing his his 12, 15 hour days a, a job, do kind of doing that. Parents split up when I was young, and that was really kind of the beginning of my story. You know, I, I bounced around a lot. I moved, you know, moved around a lot, got into a lot of, you know, adolescent trouble. I was told for, you know, many years, you're never going to be anything. You're going to end up dead or in jail. Mm-hmm. And honestly, man, I, I just, I never gave people reason to doubt that. Like, you know, I, I was like, 
one bad decision away from like you know some long term you know some long term repercussions or yeah. repercussions and I woke up man I was 17 years old in Hawaii and I was given kind of this second chance to do something and I really started to look at my life and started looking at karmic balance and and it really is important to me to give more than I take and that was a shift but you know everything for being in the music business I was a music producer DJ and uh, booking agent for some pretty large hip hop acts during the 2000s um, acts like you know Outkast and Ludacris and the Roots uh, took me to back to Salt Lake City from New York I was the entertainment director um, for some of the side stages in the Olympics left left the music business to get into corporate America um, I became a young father with a you know, a single father young with my daughter it was just the two of us and had to make that decision, you know, do I want to be a father or do I want to be a rock star? Mm-hmm. Moved to Phoenix where my dad lived, got into corporate America, and uh, spent 15 years as an executive running high-performance sales teams and marketing organiza- marketing programs for companies like IBM and Microsoft and HP and Dell and Apple. Ran a $500 million business. That was kind of my claim to fame is building a, a $500 million business inside a, a large corporate organization. I love to build a startup five years ago and just have not looked back. Right. So I've helped over, God, it's close to 4,000 startups now or entrepreneurs take ideas, monetize them, scale them and kind of put those missing pieces in. And the big, the big area that I'm really super, super excited and focused on is we built a full production film studio that does everything from not feature film stuff, but we do fill like full film production for helping people take their value proposition and their message and differentiate But now we're adding an entire, what we're calling digital streaming service for podcasts and video casts and video streaming as a service for people like yourself that that are thought leaders that want to come in and have a stage and they want to be seen and have those large production aspects behind it. God, man, you just unpacked a lot right there. That is awesome. That's it, man. You asked me where I was. That's it. (laughs) Dude, and I got to tell you, Outcast is like hands down my favorite favorite group of all time like did you spend a lot of time in atlanta when you were working with them and ludicrous no so i I did the west coast stuff so anytime they came through the west coast starting in salt lake city it usually be yeah that that rocky mountain area that we'd come up to california and that was usually where i left but just um i mean it's stories for another podcast we could talk about just my musical career dude there's been so many adventures and shit that i've gotten into that that are fun stories so how much want to dive into the first question and you mentioned some trouble that you had gotten in uh in the past at, at a younger age but i want to talk about one specific time and i want to ask you have you ever robbed a guy for a burrito <laughs> no no i have never <laughs> robbed a guy for a burrito um i did hold a guy up at knife point in Coeur d'Alene who dropped the burrito, but no, I never robbed the guy for him. <laughs> I was, Is that I was a Dave talking. Hunt? Did they ask a Dave Hutch question? All right, that, I see no, it. <laughs> it was actually Sean. It was actually Sean, but. <laughs> oh, no, here's, here's the story. Let me, let me put this in context. So we, uh, we took a group of people, some of the guys that we've been on your show. We, yeah. uh, we rode Harley Harleys from, uh, Seattle, Washington up to big sky, Montana, yeah. and then did the mountain ride and then back. And we were in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. It was the first kind of stop out of a long ride. It's, I don't know. We were on the bike for about nine or ten hours. And we were in Coeur d'Alene. It had been a long night of drinking. And um, I'm not a – like I'm, I'm a fun guy. Like who you see is who, like, is who I am. And mm-hmm. when I drink, it just accelerates. Like I don't get angry. I'm not like a fitty <laughs> guy. I, just, I keep having more fun. But I have two speeds. I go or I don't. And uh, once you get me started, it's hard to turn it <laughs> off. And we uh, – Everybody's like, all right, it's time to go. I'm like, yeah, yeah, cool. I'm just closing up my tab. And they left, and I was a couple of us stragglers. And it was like, I don't know, three, 3 in the morning at this point. And we're headed back, and there's this burrito truck. And there was the um, – I was picked on a bunch as a kid, dude. I, I, I skateboarded. I'm 42, man. I started skateboarding on the Pro-Am Tour when I was 14. Wow. And skateboarding was not cool, right? It was not a sport. Okay. So it's not nothing like it is today. I, you know, I was in I was into punk rock skateboarding and, and rap <laughs> records and it just was not that's the was not the cool thing to do. So I got a lot of shit growing up and I have no place for bullying. And we're going to this burrito truck and it was during uh, during some kind of holiday. I don't know what holiday it was, but there was a ton of like college kids out. <laughs> and one of the guys, it's it's kind of a picture perfect exactly what you think it would be. It was um, you know, six foot two, chiseled chin, blonde hair, blue eyes, and he was picking on this. Um, he was probably about, I'd say, 
maybe 190 pounds, big tall guy, a little, little stacked, and he was making fun of this kid across the street. So as he's making fun of this kid, he's making like homophobic slurs to him and making fun of his hair and all of his buddies were getting in on it. And as they were getting in on it, the kid starts crying, like the kid across the streets in tears. And I walk up and he's doing this as we're ordering food. And we walk up and we're in leather cuts and we're with some pretty cool dudes, (laughs) right? And um, he leans over to me and he goes, what do you guys think? You're in a gang? And he starts (laughs) coming down on me. And I don't – I just remember – um, a good friend of ours made these beautiful knives made out of like uh, out of uh, out of um, navy ship steel. They're like hand forged knives. Wow. And I just pulled the knife out and pulled them around the corner. And I we had a discussion <laughs> around manners and uh, not picking on kids. And he dropped he dropped his burrito. <laughs> and uh, we had a, we had a long talking to around the back of this this um, the back of this burrito truck about <laughs> not picking on people that were defenseless. And if you're going to pick on somebody, pick on somebody that can defend themselves. Oh, so God, yeah, love it. yeah, that's the burrito. There's a burrito truck story. <laughs> well, well, we can only hope that 20 years from now he'll be on a podcast one day talking about this defining moment at the burrito truck that he had. <laughs> that's right. So, what was so, the turning point where you decided to <laughs> give back, and start this charity for battered children? He's like, well, I almost got stabbed at a burrito truck in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. I had, my life. Money, I had enough money for one last burrito, and this guy pulled a knife oh. out and it hit the ground and. Yeah. So, man, let me, so let me ask you, man, one of my favorite sayings of all time is that every successful person has a painful story. And the part that I add in on the end there always is that will your successful story have a, or will your painful story have a successful ending? And so I'd love for you to just share, man, what, maybe just one, uh, cause we've all got tons of them, but just one of your painful stories that happened for you, not to you, that has made you into who you are today. So I have a book that's just about finished that the title is Why You Can't Kill Me. Hmm. And it's the uh, the superpower of overcoming adversity. Yeah. And it's all about that. It's all about the different things that in most cases, the, it's those major milestone moments that happen to us to where it, it makes or breaks you. But that's the journey, right? It's ups and downs. It's overs. Yeah. It's not a straight delineated line from where you are and where you want to be. And I would say, there's, like you said, there's a ton. I could tell you 20 different stories of major kind of turning points. That's why I wrote the book. The, a big one, especially for your listeners, that uh, let me put this into perspective. So growing up, I had a mattress on the floor. Uh, I didn't come from financial means, um, but what I did come from is I know how to work really hard. So not having financial things and not having the freedoms to find that financial wherewithal brings you, um, I have a there, – there's – there's a lot of respect I have for that. So coming up for me when I got, especially when I got into corporate America, making money was my that was my driver for success. First it was six figures. Then once I hit six figures, it was to become an executive, the youngest executive at a Fortune 500. So as I did this, I got up to making a little over four hundred thousand dollars a year. Built a beautiful house with my wife. And keep in mind, man, I didn't have we didn't build I didn't have anything growing up. Yeah. So to build a home and to pick the you know to pick the tiles and the matching cabinets and the the carpets and build out my studio and my office like to do this was a big deal. Yeah, you know, two of my kids were born in that house. Uh, two of my four kids were born in the house, not in the house, but that's the house they know. And I built as I was in corporate America, man. I I built a software company as an executive. I was building another business. Uh, I found a group of people had a need. My company didn't want to fix it. I asked them for two years to do it. They didn't. So I said, I'm going to try to solve this problem. At night and on the weekends, I taught myself how to code. I I figured out the basis of it. I brought on two full-time engineers, and we were off and running. Uh, The net of that is I raised $10 million and had a million dollars of reoccurring revenue happening inside a customer base when I left. It took six months to leave this organization to do it the right way. Brought my lawyers in, wanted to make sure I was safe. The net of that is um, I got sued because as an executive, you're always on the clock. There is no – it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter sure. if it's competing. It doesn't matter if it's not company assets. As a shareholder and executive, the loophole was you're, you're, you don't have free time. We sure. own you. So I lost everything. Wow. And a, a big moment for me was I was sitting in my, my kitchen, and this is where my social media kind of rise to fame came is – I was sitting in my in my kitchen, and behind me were all my boxes of you know all my stuff, and the power was being turned off the next day, and we were moving into a rental home. Well, my my wife had left. I didn't know if she was coming back. She was at my in laws, and I, I didn't know what was going to happen next. And I turned the phone on, and if you can see me on video, it was literally I just turned the phone sideways and recorded a video before Facebook Live was there, hmm. and I said, "This is what it's like to be an entrepreneur. Hmm. Like, let me show you." Yep. It's not about the Lambos and it's not about the vacations. It's not about the flats. It's not a rap video. 
this is what it's about is believing in something to the point where you risk the lives of everybody around you without a plan B and put it all out there and lose everything. Mm -hmm. And I'm losing everything. But here's what I know. You can't kill me. My superpower is I'm relentless. Like I'm not smarter. I'm not better. But you just I'm, we just keep coming and coming and coming. And, you know, build, it's spending 15 years inside a machine building a $500 million business. I have a lot of ideas on how to do things. Yeah. So I'm going to take you on a journey as I build a company on social media and show you how I dig myself out of this. Well, that that series of videos and that that was a turning point about three years ago where – that video series, that year I got about 2 million impressions, likes, follows, shares, wow. views. Last year I did 10 million. So I started that journey of sharing me building something from the ground up. But it was really – that was a big kind of movement for me in my adulthood life of being able to show people what it's like to lose everything and create. Everything as to how people know me is knowing me up against the wall and then watching me come through. Knowing me against the wall, watching me come through. And um, I share the real shit. I don't yeah. share the – I don't share you I, – I, dude, I don't share me on vacations, on the boats or out on the, the, the house we have in Encinitas. I don't share me out there with my kids in the, in the sports cars. I don't share any of that mm -hmm. shit. What I share is, here we go again, man. I'm up against the wall. Are we going to get it? Like what's going to happen next is I show the adversities because that's where real life is. That's where, the, that's where I was. That's where your listeners are. That's where you've been. It's what happens when everything is against the wall. You're going to lose everything or you've lost everything. Um, your marriage, your health. Dude, I got diagnosed with Lyme's disease. Hmm. Um, let me frame it like this before I dive into a tangent. There are, at the age of 25, there are the set of characteristics that are wired in your brain are what they are. How you feel, how you show up, and the kind of the way you, for, you formulate your thought process is, is science will tell you it's, it's formulated by 25. Unless. You only can change that hardwiring if one of three things happens. You have a health issue. How many people do you know that got diagnosed with cancer or got in a car accident and it completely changed their life? Yep. All of a sudden, they're, they're a completely different person because they know those minutes are ticking down or they survive through that. They're different people. Or they lose everything financially. Like they go bankrupt. They lose a job, lose their house. They, you know, they lose a business. Yep. I mean, how many people do we know that have been in that situation? That, I mean, it flips them upside down. Yeah. Or they, they go get divorced, go through a major relationship rip up, and then all of a sudden have that midlife crisis. Absolutely. Right? All of us know somebody that's had that happen. I had all three of those things happen to me at the same time two years ago. I got diagnosed with Lyme disease. I didn't know I had it. Hmm. Um, I got arthritis in my blood to the point where I couldn't hold like stuff in my hands without my hands cramping up. Wow. I would go days without sleeping, and I didn't know what was wrong with me. Um, I just knew I was always in pain. Like all the time, I just hurt. I would, that went eight, eight to nine months without being, un, without being diagnosed. Then I got a diagnosis. I didn't treat it for a few months. But I had that happen. Um, I lost a huge business that like as I was building this thing, I lost a bunch of stuff and like it collapsed on me. Uh, lost, so I lost my house. I lost my health. And I lost my relationship. And my wife was like left. Hmm. All of that happened at the same time. Wow. And then here you fast forward that system a year later and what happened? Like where am I? I'm in better shape than I've ever been in. My relationships are better than they've ever been with my wife and kids. I've got a thriving film studio that just got a huge level of funding to go this huge, to do this new project. I'm touching tens of millions of people because I didn't let any of those things like slow me down. I didn't mm -hmm. go, oh my God, God, I'm so tired. I can't get out of bed. It hurts. Well, fuck it. I still got to pay bills. Yep. Oh, I, I can't. I can't. You know, I can't go get a new revenue stream today because I just don't feel like doing it. Well, my kids don't eat, so I got to get up and go do that. Oh, I, I love my wife, but I, we're roommates. Well, fix that. Spend time mm -hmm. with my wife make sure she knows she's important. Want a better relationship with my kids? Schedule time to be with my kids. It's how you show up proactively versus reactively is a major shift when you're hit with adversity. Colby, how long ago was that video? That two years ago. Video? Two right years around. ago? Yeah, two and a half, okay. two and a half years ago probably. Yeah. I mean it's um, – yeah, I would say two and a half years ago. Man, and, and our stories are so similar. It's it's incredible. Uh, but it's the majority of the times it's people that have had these certain levels of success and then they start to unwrap and become a little bit more transparent and show you the, the raw, like good, bad, and ugly. But, man, you were at that point. What was it in that moment, like when you took your phone out and yep. hit record, like what was it that told you to do that? What was it that told you that, man, this moment right here, I will look back on as one of the most defining moments in, in my life, and I have to record this right now. What was that? Hmm. 
I don't know, man. It was just one of those things yeah. that I, I just did it. I, I can't yeah. tell you that I knew what the purpose was behind it. I can tell you why. So I've done 4,000 videos in three years. Yeah. And when you look at that, um, you know, for me, I, I have a, an equation. It's called quality content plus consistency equals value. And I take that into the marketplace. That's how we train our clients. We have huge corporate clients and we still do major marketing programs for. It's being able to slice up your content, tell your story and being honest about it. Don't tell a picture you think people want. Tell the truth. I mean, you had Waylon and Andy on the show and Dom. Yeah, it's about the honesty that a lot of people lack, and it started there. I'll tell you, it happened simultaneously to me. That happened two years ago, and then seven months ago is when everything happened with my family. Okay. So those two pivotal points for me was like the job and the finances went two years ago, and then the health and the relationships went a year later. Okay. So it's like, and then I, I showcased that too. I took some time off. I, yep. I took almost two, two and a half months offline to kind of reset. Mm -hmm. And for me, what I realized through that one was that money wasn't everything. And I, I'm smart enough to show, I'll fix it and I'll get through it. Let me show you and I'll take you on a journey. The next one was what I realized was I wasn't showing up every day with purpose. Mm -hmm. My health had gone, my relationships had gone and my money was wrong. All of those things I can change. So the things that I were, that I was doing and the, the business I was associated with and how I showed up, we built two six figure businesses in a year, dude. And I did it publicly. It just wasn't fast enough and enough money profitably to dig out of a four hundred thousand dollar debt. Sure. So it's like, I just, I just spinning and spinning and spinning, doing everything you hear on the inter like all these marketing bullshits and all these entrepreneur. You got to grind. You got to hustle. Fuck that, dude. If you're doing that stuff without purpose, what's going to happen is you're going to lose your health. You're going to lose your relationships, and you're still going to be broke, dude. I was the poster boy for grind. I still work sixty hours oh, a week. Yeah. It's like you, you will not outwork me. Like you just don't. You can't. You physically cannot do more than I do. You just, you can't do it. And I show up every day like that. But if you are not set at the baseline, mm -hmm. I wasn't set at the base, dude. Yeah. I, I didn't take time to make sure I was eating right. I wasn't hitting the gym every day. I wasn't hydrating. And then my wife, like I wasn't doing things around the house to help her. Like Monday is sports with my daughter. I do soccer. I teach. I coach soccer practice. So I get that time now with her on Mondays. Tuesdays, I'm with my son. Wednesday, I'm with my daughter again doing soccer. Thursday's date night, non-negotiable. Friday's family night. Saturday we do soccer games and it's kind of a family get together and I catch up and we do stuff around the house. Sunday's extended family where we do barbecues with my in-laws and watch sports and laundry and catch up and prep. I don't miss that stuff, dude. Like I make it like there's non-negotiables. Like I won't miss a soccer game and I will not miss date night. When I travel, if I miss one, I make it up, but I won't like I make that as is a priority just like I would my a business call. Like you and I having this podcast is important. I said I would do it. I'm here. Just like a business meeting, I treat that the same with the same a, a level of authority. But, dude, I wasn't showing up that way. And I didn't know until my wife was like, I'm out. My health left. I didn't realize that just working for the sake of working harder was not going to fix and get me where I wanted to be, which was happiness, right? Man, absolutely. And so every there's so much I want to unpack. And this is – there's typical, typical structures to podcasts. And what I love is that this is my podcast so I can structure it however the heck I want to. And I've never done this before, but I want to have you on for a second podcast. Uh, so this will be part one and then we'll do part love two it. another time because I'm bumping up against a meeting and there's just so many more questions that I want to unpack with what you just said. So man, for right now in part one of this, Tell everybody where they can find you, and then what we'll do is I'll wait probably three days to release this, the part two, and then we can get the rest cool. of the story and get this whole thing out, man, because this is so important and everybody needs to hear it. So where can people find you in the meantime online? So go to facebook.com forward slash I am, the letter I am, Colby, K-O-L-B-Y. K K A Y, or you can go to Colby K.com K O L B Y K A Y.com. The new website is just about done. By the time your listeners get live with this, it'll be up and uh, that's it, man. Awesome. Uh, dude, I'll, I'll tell you what I'd love to do on the next one is let's dive into some tactics, right? Absolutely. Your listeners are, they're entrepreneurs or business owners or marketers. There's a ton of stuff that we're doing right now to add um, value to what our clients are doing and the yeah. stuff that we're doing. So whatever we can do tactically, you know, overcoming the adversity, the story, and then giving your audience some stuff they can go do right away. Dude, that's that's 100% what we'll do. So guys, with that, thank you for tuning in to the Breadwinner podca uh, Podcast. Make sure that you check out Colby K online and then stay tuned for part two where we'll get super tactical uh, with some stuff that you'll be able to implement the next day and have it benefit your business. So with that, guys, we'll talk to you next time. Mm -hmm.